thankful for a God that's fighting with us and not against us? Who's thankful for a God that's loving and caring as he is? God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, enemies are feeling. We will shout it out, shout it out. God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness. 
the healer of every heart is in this house the healer of every broken body is in this house the creator of the universe is in this house the one who knit you together in your mother's womb is in this house ministry team would you come right now if you'd like to be healed of a sickness or a disease if you'd like to be delivered from an addiction if your home is in disarray and you would like to for god to intervene in the midst of what's going on i want to encourage you step out in faith you say pastor i don't have a whole lot of faith you don't need great faith what you need is a little faith in a great god come now it doesn't matter whether you're a guest first time visitor or a long-standing member if you'll come we want to pray for you the bible says if there's any sick among you let them call for the elders of the church they'll anoint them with oil in the name of the lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick the power is not in the person praying or in the oil it is in the name of jesus christ it's by his stripes you're healed come right now let us pray with you in jesus name if you're watching online in the name of jesus christ mom dad get your little oil pray for your children pray for your spouse in the name of jesus christ
right now. Why don't you reach out to him? Hey, God, get a hold of me today. Help me today. You know my need. You know where I am. In the name of Jesus, save me. Heal me. Deliver me. I take authority over fear and anxiety in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind it in the name of Jesus Christ. I plead the blood of every sickness and disease. I speak healing and life over your body in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb. After all these years, can you still be longing? After all these years, God, I'm still longing. After all these years, I want more. And God, come on, how many of you want more this morning? And God, with you right now come on reach up to him Lord God I'm giving you access to my mind my thoughts my heart all that I am I'm yours I surrender right now in the name of Jesus help me God rearrange my thoughts cleanse my heart deliver me hallelujah
stand at the door and knock one of the most profound principles in his word sometimes we, we want to challenge God you want to say you know God if you really want this to happen to me then you do this and this and this and, and we, we, we put God to the test you know if, if somebody comes to your house and they see that you're home and you and they knock on the door and you don't come to the door you're communicating something to them you don't have to say anything your actions have spoke louder than your words they know your home they can hear you stirring in your house and they're knocking 
you not answering the door communicates to them, I don't want you in my home. I don't want to talk to you right now. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. It is up to us to let him in. A person doesn't knock forever. They, they knock a few times and then after a while, okay, it's obvious. Sometimes we want God to pick the lock instead of coming to the door to knock. He's not going to pick the lock. He's not going to do that. You have to open up. And I can feel the Spirit of God tugging right now. I can feel it. May whatever barrier that you have erected be cast down right now in the name of Jesus Christ. May whatever wall the enemy has helped you to build, whatever wound has been cast upon you, whatever words have been spoken over you that are stopping you from going further in your walk with God, may those be erased, removed in the name of Jesus Christ. May your heart be sensitive. May your heart be easily broken. May contrition overcome you. May the goodness of God lead you to repentance. I plead the blood of the resurrected lamb over your body, Lord. I plead your blood over this group of men and women, Father, who are seeking you. Let nothing stop them from pursuing you. In Jesus' name, I pray an appetite, a hunger, a desire, God, an insatiable appetite for the things of God and for the God of those things be upon each of us, Lord. Let nothing take your place in our life. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'll tell you what needs to happen. we got to get to the place where we are not just Holy Ghost filled, but we're, we're Holy Ghost overcome. Where the Spirit of God just... We let go and you stop worrying about who's around you. Some of these kids have never been around a, a, a Holy Ghost move of God that's kind of scary. Have you ever been to church and it was kind of scary? Yeah. Things are supposed to happen in church that should be a little scary. Oh, no, no, yeah. You, if you read the Bible, things were so scary when the church started that they thought they had been drinking alcohol. That's pretty scary people behaving like that and that's how the church the Bible the New Testament church got its start was in the midst of, of that kind of craziness and there needs to not be more power above there just needs to be less resistance down below and I'm not asking you to do something other than remove the inhibition just when you come okay God whatever you want whatever you want if you don't deal with guilt and condemnation when you come here, you're going to spend the first half of the service trying to get right with God. If you're a spirit-filled believer, I want to encourage you, before you come to the house, repent. Before you get here, hey, God, wash me. Cleanse me of every unrighteousness. I'm coming to your house to worship you. Don't trust your feelings. I don't care what you said, what you thought, what you looked at. When you repented, he forgave you. Don't trust your feelings. Your feelings are lying to you. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. You're clean and you're forgiven. If you're a mature Christian, you don't follow your feelings, you follow your faith. And then you come here, and then you're easily, you easily transition into a flow of the Spirit. There are things that need to happen in church that are unexplainable. The kind of services where you go back to church, uh, work, and they say, so how was church this week? And you're like, bruh, oh, it was spooky. What do you mean? I can't explain what happened. Just supernatural things took place. Really? Yeah, yeah. What was the sermon about? I don't even remember. It was un... That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Anybody ever go to that kind of stuff before when you was a kid, when you were growing up? I remember being services like that. Holy Ghost, just the Spirit of God begins to move. Sometimes I think we're too sensitive to seekers, too sensitive to, to uh, seekers as opposed to being sensitive to the Spirit of God. Praise God. In Jesus' name. Because what everybody needs right now is what only the Holy Ghost can provide. I don't have a sermon that's going to fix what's going on in your spirit. There's, it's not going to be a sermon going to fix that. What you need is a direct touch from God so that deep inside your innermost being, you know that you know. It's going to be all right. I just know it. In the name of Jesus Christ, if there's any anxiety in this room, 
if there's any lingering fear that would try to strip the peace of God from a saint of God. I take authority over that in the name of Jesus Christ and I bind it, I cast it down and I lift the banner of peace over them in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone said amen. Amen. Clap your hands to the Lord. On your way back to your seats, why don't you shake somebody's hand, hug their neck, say something kind and complimentary to them. Someone you don't know, introduce yourself to them. Look around. Lots of guests in the house. That's right. Say something nice. You can make it up. It's okay. Like your outfit. Nice shoes. Yeah, you're looking sharp. I love hearing that. You hear that buzz? That's a sign of a healthy church. That buzz, right? Why don't we make some noise for our church? That's what I'm talking about. As you've heard, youth camps have been canceled, but we are hosting our own youth camp. Yeah. The title of our youth camp is Activated. Say Activated. So if you want your young person activated for the kingdom of God, you do not want them to miss this camp. Registration is open. If you go to the Jesus Worship Center website, under More tab, there's an event. It is our, uh, under the calendar. My bad. That's my bad. I believe it's under the calendar. You'll find it. Just go to the website. Go through all the tabs because you should be looking at the website anyway. And go in and register your young person for youth camp. Registration is not $150. It is $100. Why don't we make some noise for that? Yeah, we dropped the price. The dates for camp is uh, July 30th through August 1st. You don't want to miss it. The registration deadline is July 16th. That'll give us enough time to go buy food for, our, for the amount of people that we need. If you need help for camp, come to me before July 16th. We need to know before that deadline so we can have an accurate head count. We understand that, you know, sometimes finances do not always play out. We will help you. Do not let money be a reason that your young person is not at our youth camp. We also have uh, She's for Christ cans uh, available to you. She's for Christ is a youth fundraiser that we raise money for missions. Who loves missions? I love missions. Amen. So we're going to uh, we're gonna be raising money. We have an amount that we would like to get to this year. It's $5,000. So if you can help us get to that amount, we would greatly appreciate it. If you need more information on either Youth Camp or She's for Christ, you can come see me after service. Thank you, guys. I love you all. Awesome job, Charlie. That's an easy fundraiser. Just filling those cans with coins and just return the cans. Take your pocket change and change somebody's life. Is that cool, man? The chunk is in the house. Making mama's face red and puffy. It's great to see you, Cole, man. I love you. Amen. Amen. First, when John and Charlotte started coming to church, Cole was SpongeBob SquarePants. He's he just a little, and he was thick. You could tell, okay, he's going to be a linebacker. And his, his feet were, the pads on his feet were this thick. He'd run across that limestone. He's just a country boy. It's great to see you, Cole, man. I love you. Forgive me for, for taking a personal moment there, but... I'm so honored to have all of you here today. We've got some quick announcements. Most of them are in your notes in the handout that whenever you came in today. Um, but next Sunday, the first few minutes of the service, we're going to honor our graduating seniors. This has been a year unlike any year, hopefully ever again. And so we want to do something special for them, a little different. So I apologize to all the previous seniors and future seniors, but this is a special year, as you know. And so we're going to do something special for them at the very beginning of the service. And then after that, it'll be a complete worship set and regular service. So make sure you're here for that. The following Sunday is Father's Day, and I got a very special treat for you on Father's Day. International evangelist Mark Drost is going to be with us, and if you don't know Brother Drost, uh, you are going to be introduced to a powerful, powerful ministry. Gifts of the Spirit, signs, wonders, and miracles. He's had hundreds of the Holy Ghost this year already, and many notable miracles, one of which my family and I witnessed last year at camp meeting when the Lord healed a young pastor's wife of a stroke. She could not uh, walk without the help of a walker, and God instantly healed her right before our eyes. It was amazing. You don't want to miss that service that is on Father's Day. And I'm so proud of Brother Zachary and Sister Crystal Marceau. 
They're hosting our own Vacation Bible School that's going to be coming up June the 22nd. And uh, another thing, our young, excuse me, our music department, they're also doing a little fundraiser, uh, raising, selling those sheets, those very nice, comfortable, soft cotton sheets. And they're raising funds for some in-ear monitors, a device we need for the sound system up here. And if, I think that sale ends Wednesday. So if you're interested in buying these sheets, they're very nice. My wife and I own several, I don't know, probably half a dozen sets for all of the beds. And we have multiple colors. They're very comfortable. They're phenomenal. And they're very inexpensive. And that helps us a lot. So there you go. To all of our guests, so grateful to see you today. And I got a, ch a chance to shake most of your hands. If I didn't, please forgive me. But to all of you who, who are here today, you're visiting. We're so honored to have you here. And I see some family members here. I see Kyle. This is Belton and Sheila's son. It's, it's great to see you, Miss Cassie. Thank you so much for coming today. To all of our guests, we're honored that you're here. If you would remain seated one moment, if you're a guest, while the Jesus Worship Center stands and honors you. Below, great to see you. Below, two in a row. It's great to see Mike Manuel's family here. God bless you. Thank you for being here. You may be seated. I want to just give public kudos to Trent and Emily Boudreau. Uh, excuse me, Trent and Kim Boudreau. <laughs> I don't know if Emily had anything to do with it, but I know Trent and Kim did. But they uh, blessed the church with their skill and it built and installed custom cabinets for our office and for the nursery. And we're so thankful for that. Thank you for that, guys. It saved us a bunch of money at the same time. Um, just very, very grateful. I've got some certificates up here of things that have happened of late. We always celebrate new birth, and I'm going to be celebrating the birth of a grandson here pretty soon, so you'll be hearing every sermon will be about grandchildren from that point forward. Just letting you know in advance. Oh, God, what's he preaching on? We know Lincoln John, LJ, love Jesus. That's what it stands for. <laughs> Briley Cox was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. On June 27th, 2018. But by God, she's getting her certificate today. I am proud of you. Where's that camera? Awesome, awesome. awesome. <laughs> That's great. And this past Wednesday, uh, we had a very... So he's not here. I, I see that he's not here, but... Brother Charles Gotro uh, has been witnessing to a friend of his who loves God and just was just showing that there's just a little bit more. And this past Wednesday, he came to church. His name is Zane. He works at uh, Sterling, I think is what it is now, Automotive. And God filled him with the Holy Ghost in the baptistry. Isn't that awesome? And Brother Charlie got to do that. On May 31st, I believe that was last week, Mariah Manuel was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And I hope I spelled it right. It's M-A-R. Yes. This is Brother Mike's daughter. Sitting right here. Awesome. Thank you. Just great. I don't know if he's here. Is Caleb here? Caleb Manuel. His uh, son was, uh, was baptized also in Jesus' name. You want me to hold this, Brother Mike, or you want me to give it to you? Wait till he comes back. All right. Cool beans. And then uh, if you notice a big, like, emptiness in the spirit world that's because a big chunk of the Holy Ghost was deposited in Gwen Hansen <laughs> come on down Miss Gwen this girl has been baptized in Jesus name filled with the Holy Ghost <laughs> every time someone's baptized in Jesus name or filled with the Holy Ghost in the spirit realm demons here that's what they hear. Just awesome. And then, just, just fantastic. It's, it's official. But last Sunday, God filled Julie and Glenn Carlson with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Terrible time for a potty break. Hang on. We're taking a... Congratulations. Give my hand. That's awesome. And knowing Julie, she's very happy that she missed that because she does not enjoy the, the spotlight at all. Amen. I love you all so very much. I'm so proud of you. There's a, there's a wonderful spirit here. You feel the warmth? You feel the love? Miss Julie, we hate to embarrass you, but I just gave you certificates. We're happy for you. We love you. Glenn, come, 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 come. We can't miss this. Come, 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 come. 
We got to, hey, just pretend like it was the first time. All right, awesome. <laughs> That's just great. This is what the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be the no judgment zone. It's supposed to be the place where you find help and healing and mercy and kindness. Can I have an amen? And God is going to lift you up today. He's going to encourage you today. He's going to bless you today. I'm so excited. I have a great, great word for you. Would you join me in standing, please? Kyle, it's great to see you again. I'm so glad you're here. Miss Haley, I'm, I'm just grateful for what God's doing in your life. I'm, 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 I'm seeing people grow. I'm watching God touch people's lives, and it's just, it's just fantastic. I'm the setting of our giving today, which is important. Today is the first Sunday of the month, and we've designated today as uh, the first Sunday sacrificial offering for phase two. And uh, we're going to be adding, we, we have a phenomenal building. I'm grateful for it. We, we built what we could afford at the time. And we put most of the money in the building into the sanctuary. And uh, so what we need desperately is between eight to 10,000 square feet of educational and multi-use space. We need classrooms, a children's ministry area, and a youth ministry area. And so we've got plans drawn up for a building that it, when it finally fizzles, when it finally comes out, it, it'll, it might be different, but it's basically a, a long rectangular building between 50 to 75 feet wide and between 100 to 150 feet long. I know it's crazy numbers, but we're working on these numbers and with the contractors. I'd love to build that for cash, at least the, the concrete and the steel to get all that done. We've raised uh, over $70,000 already, and we, we would like to raise about 300000 and that would probably give us enough money to get the steel purchased, erected, get the dirt work done, the slab poured and then I believe we have enough skills as witnessed by Trent and many others in our church to, to do a lot of the work ourselves. I know we have men and women who know how to paint who know how to do drywall work who can do electrical work but we got to get the shell up and so that's why I'm asking you for this year on the first Sunday if you would set aside a certain amount maybe you forgot maybe you didn't remember you can send it in this week or next week but we're designated the first Sunday of the month I've given an extra $500 today towards that project and I'm asking you to help join me and I know you're hearing all types of requests. Somebody else mentioned the youth camps. If you can help those students, uh, maybe next Sunday I'll mention that again. But there are some people that can't afford $100 to go to camp, and that we want to help them also. So, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, you, you are here in such a real way, and we're so grateful. And we want to continue the energy and the momentum and the spiritual power that's present in this house we do that, Lord, by funding your kingdom. I thank you for the men and women who honor you in their tithe, who also give sacrificial offerings, supporting our missionaries, supporting the radio broadcast, and also towards this very special endeavor on phase two. I thank you for all of it. And I speak blessings and favor over each man and woman who honors you in this very real, tangible way in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Our ministry team is going to stand up here and speak blessings over each of you as you return to God your tithe and offering. You can also text to give. The number's on the screen. You can give at the kiosk in the foyer as well.
time hallelujah to the lamb hallelujah to the lamb again forgive me for just a moment but I sometimes as a pastor it seems like that the church is hitting on all eight cylinders it just feels like everything is right in the world the church is just the presence of God the power of God the, the people who have volunteered their times and it's just this morning is one of those Sundays and I'm just so grateful I'm just so grateful to be your pastor I'm so grateful that God called me I'm so grateful that he allowed me to serve him in my hometown and I thank you for letting me past you today would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise God I love you with all my heart something supernatural happens when you have a pastor in your life Jeff Something special happened when I prayed for you. No other person on the planet can do that for you. That's the office of a pastor. This might sound egotistical. It has nothing to do with me. It has to do with what he's called me to. There'll be another man one day in this desk. There'll be another man in this office. You must have a pastor. It's a gift from God. It's a gift from God. Amen. All right. You ready for the word? I have prayed. I've talked to the Lord. I have fasted. I have studied. I am prepared for this moment, and I want to give you a word. Would you go with me? If you can return to your seats and remain standing, I'm going to read one verse of Scripture, and you will not get the title of my message this morning until three-fourths of the way through the message. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 1. I want to thank the people who have traveled 
couple here that drove all the way from Lafayette. Thank you for coming. They listened to me on the radio, and uh, we've known each other for years, but they're here this morning. Thank you for making the drive from Lafayette. Would you give them a hand? Thank you so much for being here. And Evan and Julie are friends with David and Jackie Bull, but they've driven from, I guess, Lake Charles Sulphur area. But thank you for coming from the other side of the world. We appreciate you being here. God bless you. Amen. Amen. One verse of scripture. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also. Ooh. I should have preached the message title, I saw also. Save that for another time. Say also. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. <clears throat> That's the only verse. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now, Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your unbelievable presence. Nothing I can say can outdo or trump what you've just done. And I'm not going to try to. I'm just asking, Lord, that you would anoint me for this moment to speak this word that I believe you gave me. May it reach its mark. <clears throat> May the hearts of every human that is hearing the word be soft and may they receive a permanent indentation from your word. Adjust. Help us. Help us to make course corrections. Activate and motivate us this day in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Would you clap your hands to the Lord one last time? All right. You may be seated. This year has already been a doozy. I actually wrote that. <laughs> I don't know if doozy spelled correctly, but I, I wrote doozy. It's been a doozy, hasn't it? Let's see, we've had the coronavirus where 2.2 million Americans were going to die. And the response to me has been way more lethal than the respiratory illness. The lockdown of the healthy people. Then we've got the six-foot social distancing, the masks, the gloves. Can't touch anything. Shut down the economy. Businesses lost. 40 million unemployed. Highest unemployment ever. Larger than during the Great Depression. Then even today in many places in America, you can, you can burn a church, but you can't go to church. You can loot a store, but you can't shop at the store. You can destroy the business, but you can't run your own business. You can break the law because they won't enforce the law. This is 2020. We're told we can't go to church, cannot assemble. You can do drive-in church or do church online because we're going to flatten the curve and keep the healthcare industry from being overwhelmed only for two or th three weeks maximum. Yet here we are 12 plus weeks later. The social, then, then on top of all that, social media erupts with a viral video of Amud Arbery getting killed and old wounds are reopened. Fuel is thrown on smoldering hate. In 2012, the great economist and author Thomas Sowell, whom I follow often, made these remarks. He said, racism is not dead, but it is on life support, kept alive by politicians, race hustlers, and people who get a sense of superiority by denouncing others as racists. Hold on, there's more. Then there are locusts. Swarms of locusts consuming crops all over the planet, even as we speak. Swarms so thick they create storm-like clouds in the sky. These vegetarian predators consume all the green, leafy vegetation in already poverty-stricken areas, plunging the poor into deeper despair. Then we have the plot to overthrow or at least undo the election of a duly elected American president. He's been accused of being a Russian agent, of colluding with Russia to sway an American election. Bob Mueller with, uh, was tasked with the job of uncovering this intricate web of deceit. And after three years and over $20 million of taxpayer money, if his investigation proves none of those accusations. In fact, the investigators are now being investigated. 
Their fake dossier bought and paid for by the opposition party is now the evidence and what appears to be the biggest scam of any presidential election. Am I getting you mad yet? Didn't you come to church to avoid all this stuff? Stay with me. But wait, there's more. Ushers, don't let anybody out the building. After those leave, look, they're like, I gotta go. It's those, those are the musicians, but they're the ones with the bad attitudes anyway. But wait, there's more. Another video recently serviced where a police officer appears to have used unreasonable and unnecessary brutal and lethal force to subdue a criminal suspect, resulting in his death. Somebody's already mad at me. My God, he said unreasonable and unnecessary. Just, just, just hang on. Now we have major protests throughout the nation, and not just peaceful protests. Many protests are being hijacked by rioters who've been trained and organized, deployed, and paid for by billionaire political agitators whose global agenda appears to be aligned with the Antichrist's mission of a global one world view, one world monetary system, and one world religion. These violent riots have been occurring in all of our largest major cities, Minneapolis, Chicago, Boston, Los Angeles, Dallas, and New York. Businesses burned to the ground. New York, New York City looks like Gotham City in some dark genre Batman cinematic production. Louis Vuitton and many other high-end luxury stores have been looted on Rodeo Drive in downtown Los Angeles. You still with me? Pallets of bricks have been drop shipped to these cities to be used as hand thrown projectiles. And when that is insufficient, these rioters, as they approach the White House, use crowbars to pry pavers out of our national park sidewalks, to hurl at the nation's park police and secret service agents, sending over 100 of them to hospital and placing no less than 12 in critical conditions. Nearly a dozen have already been killed in these riots. And now, literally today, even as we speak, we have a record tropical storm taking place History is being made because it's the earliest name storm yet. I know. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I'm being too political. Oh, maybe you think I'm not being political enough. Maybe you think I'm not being specific enough. Maybe you're wanting me to apply all of my passion and all of my fury and muster all of the skills and influence I possess to take a side. Yeah. Come on, pastor, say it. You just can't wait. You're salivating. Oh, he's going to say it. Today's the day. Today's the day. Oh, it's on now. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you a little Twitter. I'm going to give you a little video. Just hang on, hang on. Just stay with me. I have spent considerable time and effort reading and researching and praying about all of this. And today, I'm prepared to make a statement. Are you watching? Today, Heart rates are going up right now. I can feel it. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Please be on my side, Pastor. Please, please say what I want you to say. I want you to tell all your white friends and all your black friends and all your blended friends. I want you to tell the Democrats and the Republicans, the liberals and the conservatives, to, play close, to pay close attention to what I'm about to say. As a matter of fact, you may contact Black Lives Matter, Antifa, as well as white supremacist organizations. Because today, this morning, I have finally mustered the nerve, the energy, the courage to go on record and make a public statement about all of it. And I do mean all of it. I want to go on record so that there is no doubt, no ambiguity, and no vacillating on my part as to where I stand on all of these issues. Are you ready for it? Ushers, Brother Cloven, you're a big dude. Guard that door. Don't let anybody walk out. I don't see anybody at the back door. Brother Donald, make sure nobody escapes. Yet I'm, what I'm about to say is going to make somebody mad. I know it. So y'all just get ready. You ready? Y'all ready? I'm, fix, I'm, tell, I'm fixing to say something right now. And when I speak my position, I don't want anybody to get up and walk out. Y'all can control yourself. You ready? I am convinced that all of this and every bit of it is one Big distraction. That's all it is. Yeah, yeah. It's a distraction about... No, I'm not talking about Donald Trump. I'm not talking about presidential elections. I'm not talking about America. I'm talking about something bigger than every bit of that. And that is the kingdom of God. All of this is one big distraction. 
one big attempt of Satan to get your eyes off of the most important prize, which is not being right, not being able to defeat someone in a stupid debate, not being able to prove a racist wrong or someone who isn't a racist that they are or someone who isn't that they are not or whatever. That's not the point. The most important point right now is that Jesus Christ is the answer to all of this mess. I don't have to leave now. I'm so glad you decided to stay. I am here today to lift up the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You just trying to hide behind the cross. You got it. <laughs> you got it. I've done it my whole life. I've done it my whole life. My whole life. I'm hiding behind Calvary. I'm hiding behind the finished work of Calvary. I know I'm dirty. I know I'm unclean. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm wicked. I know I deserve death. I know I deserve damnation. I know I deserve hell. But what Jesus did on Calvary 2,000 years ago, he took the penalty. He paid the price. He paid the price. I'm never getting away from the cross. Not going to do it. I'm not going to get in front of it and begin to judge you. I'm not going to get in front of it and pretend that I can claim where you're going to go and spend eternity. What I can do is get behind the cross of Calvary and lift up the name of the only one that has your answer. He has your answer. He has this nation's answer. He has black lives man's answer. He has everybody's answer. The answer is not racial harmony. The answer is spiritual harmony. The answer is you and I getting right with God and trusting God with the rest. It's so much easier to steal from God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Let me at it, God. I can do it a whole lot better and a whole lot quicker. Oh, no, you can't. Oh, no, you can't. Philippians 2 and 10 says, at the name of Jesus, every knee's going to bow. Of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee is going to bow. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what your political persuasion is. Adolf Hitler and his Nazi troops are going to bow their knees and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every, every knee is going to bow. Say every knee. every knee. Marilyn Manson's knee is going to bow. Ozzy Osbourne's knee is going to bow. John Bon Jovi's knee is going to bow. Ted Nugent's knee is going to bow. Rush Limbaugh's knee is going to bow. Every knee is going to bow. Clifton Lejeune's knee is going to bow. Every governor, every president, every king, every prince, every princess, every duke, every earl, every last human being that ever lived is going to confess. Why? Because that was the issue that was always the issue it's always been the issue jesus has always been the issue lift up your eyes above the fray lift up your eyes above all of this stuff come up for air disconnect from social media stop watching the news i've said it a thousand times i've said it too many times it's, it's not getting to you yet what you feed thrives what you starve dies. Would you like more anxiety? Would you like more fear? Would you like to stay up late? Awesome. Spend three hours watching the news tomorrow. That's, what, that's all you got to do. We don't have scrolls anymore, but we do scroll all the time. So we've replaced scrolls with the ability to scroll and endless scroll. At least if we had scrolls, you'd have to stop at the end of the scroll. But there is no end to scrolling. Feeding the appetite. That's insatiable. The word distract means to cause to turn away from the original focus of attention or to divert. It means to pull in conflicting emotional directions. It means to unsettle. It is derived from a Latin phrase simply meaning to pull away. 
That's all Satan wants. He wants you distracted. Just ask Peter. The moment he got his eyes off of Jesus Christ, he began to sink. It was just a distraction. The storm didn't sink, Peter. It was a distraction. The wind didn't sink, Peter. It was a distraction. The water didn't consume, Peter. It was a distraction. He was destroyed, being destroyed because of a distraction. But there is a king that is sitting on top of a throne who has never been dethroned. This is why in the book of Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to go through this really fast. I apologize to my media man. 625, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What you shall eat, drink, what's on your body. Verse 26, the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather in barns. But your heavenly father feedeth them. Are you not much more better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? Why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. But I say to you that every Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith, therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or with shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek. That's him calling out a specific race of people, by the way. For your heavenly father, did that mess you up? Hang on. <laughs> For your heavenly father knoweth that you have need of all these things. He knows you have need of these things. But seek ye first. He was talking about food and all the stuff. You know. He said, seek first be be before breakfast, before lunch. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. The NIV says that each day has enough trouble of its own. Why are you borrowing trouble? Sitting around contemplating what's going to happen Jesus Christ is king of kings. How foolish of you and I to get distracted with, with paltry, temporary issues when there's something greater that overshadows all of it. On the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus invited Peter and John, would see Jesus, the savior of the world, having a conversation with the two most symbolic men of the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah. Think about that. It was such a, a deal that Peter wanted to build an altar. <laughs> That's idolatry to, to Moses and Elijah. He's seeing these great men basically be reincarnated, whether it's a hologram or what, I don't know. But on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus allows Peter and John to see Jesus speaking to Elijah and Moses, representing the law and the prophets. It was there on the Mount of Transfiguration. After they fall on ye him. Now, you realize that the entire Old Testament is law and prophets. But the voice of God is saying in the presence of the law and the prophets, listen to Jesus. It's here when this is spoken that this powerful jewel of a verse is hidden in plain view. Watch this. When the disciples heard it, when they heard that voice, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. That means they were such, so afraid that blisters broke out on their body. <laughs> Eden said, no. Well, they were sore afraid, Ed. They were sore afraid. Verse 7. And Jesus came and touched them and said, arise, be not afraid. Verse 8. Watch. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man. Save Jesus only. They saw no man save Jesus only. What's the application? If you are a reader of his word, if you are consuming the law and the prophets, then you are to be transformed so that when you lift up your eyes, you see no man save Jesus only. It'd do for you what it did for me, but it did more for me than that. I'll tell you right now. I see no man. You start seeing Jesus 
in people who can't stand you. You start seeing Jesus in people who are trying to destroy you. You start seeing Jesus in people who are falsely accusing you. You start seeing Jesus in people who are trying to kill you. You start seeing, you see no man save Jesus. You can always tell when someone has not been transfigured. When they have not gone through a metamorphosis. When they have not been born again because they still see men. Paul in 1 Corinthians, I didn't give this to the media, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the church in Corinth was full of carnality and stupidity and fornication and and the gifts of the Spirit, all this at the same time. And Paul says this, he says in verse 2, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all I want to know. I don't care who's on Apollo's side, who's on Paul's side. I don't care. All I want to know is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is the answer this world is looking for. Get your eyes off of anything that gets your eyes off of Jesus Christ. Get your eyes off of anything that gets your eyes off of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12 and 2 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Why would I do that? He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. So look at our text in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. Isaiah saw one throne vacated and he saw another throne celebrated. One throne was temporary, another throne was eternal. Earthly kings may reign for a few decades, but God's throne, his reign is an everlasting reign. Can I have an amen? What's significant about this is Uzziah was a great, powerful man. If you read about all the things that Uzziah did, he was unlike any other king since Solomon. In 2 Chronicles 26, the Bible says Uzziah provided shields, spears, helmets, coats of armor, bows, sling stones for the entire army. In Jerusalem, he made machines designed by skillful men for use on the towers and on the corner defenses to shoot arrows and hurl large stones. His fame spread far and wide for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. God anointed this man. He was powerful. He made Israel a superpower. And in the year that he died, In the year, Isaiah said, that my political hero died. In the year that the political world was turned upside down. In the year when everything was stable and it became unstable. In the year when I didn't know what to do. In the year when there was panic and anxiety. In that year, I saw also the Lord. I'm here to tell you, you need to see also the Lord. The distraction has led to detraction. To detract means to draw, to take away, to divert. It means to speak ill of, to belittle, to undergo a reduction in value. Second Thessalonians 2, let no man deceive you by any means for that day. The end time shall not come except there come a falling away first. Paul prophesied under the anointing of the Holy Ghost that before that great and terrible day of the Lord's return, there would be an, a, a falling away, an apostasy. Look up the word apostasy. It means abandonment of one's religious faith. It comes from a phrase meaning to revolt. In the last days, there will be a revolt. People will walk away from what they believed. I see it in the tribe reports. Pastor, so-and-so decided they're not coming back. Okay. Do you know that I can't make you do anything? (laughs) You know I cannot make your children. I can't make anybody do anything. I can't even make me do hardly anything. But I can influence. That's the great office of a pastor. It's what's called the bully pulpit. In elections and political realms, it's called a bully pulpit. The the mayor has a bully pulpit. The president of the city council has a bully pulpit. The governor has a bully pulpit. The president has a bully pulpit. Because they are the lead of an executive branch of government. And therefore they have Full, uh, they have influence. They have a bully pulpit. And so as a pastor, I hope I don't have a bully pulpit. I certainly don't have a woolly pulpit. <laughs> but I have the pulpit's design is to influence. But it's up to you to decide if you're going to be influenced. It's up to you to decide right now if this is a good message or not. Was this, was this from God or was this just him playing with words? What is this about? He's just telling us to look to Jesus. That's all he's really saying. You got me. 
All he's saying is Jesus is everything and don't worry about everything else. Mila, you're smarter than you look. It's really not that complicated. So look at Jesus. How does it begin? He sees Peter and John. And he says, uh, follow me. And what do Peter and John do? What does that mean? What am I going to do for food? What about my mom and my dad? I'm right in the middle of an education. Can you explain what that means? Where are we sleeping tonight? What am I going to wear? All I've got is clothes on my back. What am I going to drive? What about my car? I'm not even married. Where's my wife? What about my kid? None of it. Jesus makes it really simple. Follow me. That's it. What do you do about the rest? It don't matter about the rest. It don't matter. We know Peter has a wife. There's no mention about her. Whenever Jesus says, follow me. Did he have the wife before that he started following Christ or after? We don't know and it don't matter. All that matters is Peter and John did exactly what Jesus said. Just follow me. That's what you need to do. Just follow him. The rest will work itself out. This is deep. It's easy to be distracted by your detractors. Name calling is a de facto weapon of Satan. It's a lie. I'm I'm trolling your social media accounts right now to see what you're for and see what you're against. And if I don't see what I'm looking for, you know who you are. You've got this stuff going on in the culture. This, this shaming and guilt and, and call it what it is, just a bunch of peer pressure. That's all it is. These same people who are looking for these things, they're not saying anything about genitalia mutilation in Africa. They're not saying anything about the cannibalism taking place in the Amazon. Are they far cannibals? Are you far, you, are you far cannibals? When was the last time you posted something against cannibalism? <laughs> How ridiculous that if you don't speak against something, you must be for it. You know good and well I'm against broccoli. Stop sending me broccoli pictures. I get broccoli pictures all the time. Thinking of you, Pastor. (laughs) So me telling you what I'm against hadn't changed a thing. You're still going to be for it. People are going to be what they're for. It don't matter. You, you've got to have some sense here. There's something bigger than all this junk. There's something bigger than the next election. There's something bigger than harmony. You're never going to get what you want on this earth. There is no political. There's no political system. There's no country. There's no place where utopia exists. This is a fallen world. Do you hear me? Listen to me. It's a fallen world. No matter who you elect, you are electing a human being. No matter who is the pastor, who is the evangelist, it doesn't matter who, you are listening to a human being. A human who is falling, who has to repent every day. For us to look to humans to be our savior is the fault. That's the problem. There is not going to be some president that's a great uniter or some governor. Yes, yes, yes. They can all contribute to helping the thing. But ultimately, it doesn't exist on the earth. What you're looking for comes from Jesus Christ and his kingdom. There is a peace that can exist in you that no amount of harmony on this planet can replace. All this name calling. I know where that comes from. Revelations 12 and 10. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren. You know what an accuser is, right? A name caller. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which has accused them before our God day and night. The accuser is the one that says guilty. Guilty until proven innocent. Guilty until you test otherwise. Infected until you test clear. It's the most un-American thing in the world, this disease. Everyone's got it until you can prove you don't have it. And even when you prove you don't have it, you still had it. Therefore, now we know you had it and we can control you. It is demonic. I am telling you that all of this has demonic, nefarious fingerprints all over it. You need to get your act together and get right with God immediately. Jesus is coming soon. Morning or night, 
our noon and many may meet their doom but a trumpet's going to sound and when that trumpet sounds our plan will rise off of this planet the accuser of the brethren has been cast down and verse 11 says and they overcame him they overcame who? the accuser of the brethren what's the accuser of the brethren? the name caller the one that cries guilty the one that cries no good low down scoundrel the one that cries lost, the one that cries out deserving of hell, the accuser. And they overcame their accuser. They overcame their detractor. How? By the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. Who is the hymn of verse 11? Answer, the accuser of the brethren. The way we overcome our accusers, the way we overcome our detractors is three ways. Number one, his blood. Number two, our testimony, and number three, our willingness to be killed over those two things. <laughs> Hold up, swole up. <laughs> I mean, I love Jesus and everything, but I don't want to die for him. Listen, if you're not willing to die for this, you're not going to live for this very long. This has to be in us. This has to be in us. Last week on my Facebook Live, I, everything gets a blur because there's so many things I'm talking about now. I talked about the liability of a label. And I mentioned that labels are used for identifying or for classification. And if you allow someone to label you, you will ultimately live up to that label. And so the purpose of the label is to get you to shut your lip. Okay, so you're a racist or you're a conservative or you're a left-wing nut job, liberal freak or whatever, just a label. If, if they can get you labeled, Shut your mouth, because no matter what you say, I don't have to listen to it because I got a label for you. You got to be careful who labels you. You got to be very careful. The only label I want to wear is a label that didn't come from a man. It didn't come from a woman. It didn't come from a parent. It didn't come from a human being. It came from God himself. If you let the Satan, loose, if you let Lucifer label you, then you will say all the things that he wants you to say. I'm here to tell you that you are not a hypocrite. You are not a backslider. You are not hell bound. You are not an addict. You are not a loser. You are not a mistake. You are a product of divine providence. You are the apple of his eye. He knows the thoughts that he thinks towards you. You literally are all that he has on his mind. And all of the distraction has led to detraction, and that sets you up for a retraction. To retract is to take back, to disavow. It's what we do when we dissolve our marriages. We take back our vow. We retract. Luke 9, another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first. Let me tell you something. You cannot follow Jesus and say the words, let me first. If you're saying, I will, me first, no. Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first. Go bid them farewell, which are at my house. Jesus said to him, no man, having put his hand to the plow, looking back is fit for the kingdom. That's a hard rule. Hey, bruh, don't get all, got all huffy puffy. I just want to tell my mama goodbye. Think about that. That's all the dude asked for. He didn't say, give me a few months to think about it. Let me pray and fast. He just said, look, give me a second. Tell my, man, my family bye. Jesus said, you put your hands to the plow, look back. You ain't fit for the kingdom. Oh, brother, that's the way you feel about it. Just go on your merry way. I'll do me. You do you. That's, that's, that is exactly how you would have responded had you not known who it was. If you knew who it was in this room right now, if you knew who it was I was preaching about, if you really believed what I was saying, there's not a one of you who would not do what I'm going to ask you to do at the end of this service. Every last one of you, if you knew in fact that he was who I'm saying he is, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Savior of the world, if he is in fact that one that you are going to meet face to face, if he is in fact the one Jeb that I told you, you're going to face him one day, face to face. Every one of us is going to look at him in the eye without, without someone next to us representing us, knowing that. I'm going to give an account for my life. And for what he's given me, I think I've got some things I can do. It's what Satan is after, throwing the towel. Declare it's too hard. This living for God stuff is for the strong. It's for the special ones, for the gifted. 
I love when, I'm grateful when people say nice things about me, but sometimes it hurts my feelings because I'm thinking, since they said that about me, they think they're excused from living for God. When I can't memorize scripture and I can't quote like you, you don't have to do anything like anybody. I can't sing like them, but they ain't keep me from singing. If they get off pitch, that's because they're listening to me. <laughs> By God, I'm going to sing. If you ever notice whenever I'm singing, the microphone's out here, I am lip syncing because I want the camera to make it look like I'm singing that good. But I can't sing good, but I can sing. But if I waste my life trying to sing like Lakin or Aaron or, or my son-in-law Jacob, that's just ridiculous. I'm, I'm not going to, God didn't give that to me. Don't waste your time trying to be like someone else. You want to be like Jesus. <laughs> Renounce him, Satan whispers uh, in your, at your most vulnerable moments. And all of this, all of these apocalyptic events have been one big distraction resulting in detraction with the hopes of your retraction. Say something, then pay attention to what others are saying about you, then you say something you will regret. Of course, Satan is it done. His strategy of distraction, detraction, and retraction is finally to arrive at subtraction. He wants to take away your hope. He wants to take away your vision, your dream, your joy, your purpose. And if he succeeds, it will result in his ultimate triumph. And do you know what that is? It is your inaction. That's what he's after. What's the use? What's the use? This world's so messed up. Why even vote? Why even go to work? Why even try? The people that are going to go to hell are going to go to hell. Nobody wants what I have anyway. Inaction is what he's after. So finally, I get to my title. <laughs> and my title is simply my reaction to the distraction. Would you like to know what my reaction is to the distraction? My reaction to the distraction is a call to action. I'm not trying to make you an activist that will march in the streets. I'm trying to make you a Bible-believing, Holy Ghost-filled Christian that will walk next door and invite a neighbor and teach a Bible study. He did not say go and build fancy buildings that can attract crowds and put playground equipment and basketball goals and, and, and racquetball courts. And it's okay for us to do that, but that's not the mandate. The mandate is go and make disciples. The mandate isn't go to a cool church where there is no judgment, where there's great singing and you freeze to death most of the time. Unless you're having hot flashes while everybody else is freezing. <laughs> It's awesome, every service. That, that's, that's not the mandate. The, the mandate is go and make disciples. You've got to give it to get it. Got it? Good. You've heard me say it a thousand times. The people who don't get it aren't giving it. The reason your faith is shriveled and drying up is because you haven't shared it with anybody lately. When was the last time you defended your faith? When was the last time you tried to convince someone of the necessity of the blood, the water, and the spirit? When was the last time you talked to someone about the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection? When was the last time you spoke with them, to them with such conviction that they said, well, then what am I supposed to do? And then you reply like the first pope replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is a call to action. The New Testament church began in the book of action. The fifth book of the New Testament is the book of Acts. It is the book of actions. It is the actions of the apostles. It is the actions of the Holy Ghost. We are under Jonah's mandate. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, arise, go to Nineveh. The reason we don't go to Nineveh is because we haven't done the first part. You've got to be able to experience an upward before you can obey his onward. And once you get up, then you can go. Arise and go. Arise and go. The reason we don't go is because we're down with guilt and condemnation and carnality. I'm at the end of the message. In case you haven't figured out what we're talking about, I'm talking about evangelism. I'm talking about reaching the lost. Right now, there are mamas and dads in this room who have kids who are backslidden. And I know what you're praying. 
save my kid. And if you're smart, you're praying a little more specific prayer. Oh God, put someone in their life that believes this message. Let them come across someone at work that shares this faith. If you're smart, you pray those kind of prayers. Well, let me ask you a question. Where do you think those people come from? Where do you think those people come from? The people you're hoping reaches your son, reaches your grandchild. Where do you think they come from? I'll tell you where they come from. They come from churches that preach sermons like this. That make sloppy saints feel rotten and uncomfortable for just coming to church like a SpongeBob SquarePants and absorbing services and absorbing ministry. I used to run people off all the time. That was my habit. A guest would come to church. As long as they didn't look Pentecostal, they were welcome. But if they looked Pentecostal, I was so disappointed. Just hear me out. I'd walk up to them and I'd say, hey, hey, man, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for coming today. If you're looking for a good church that's really going to bless you and bless your family with great ministry, this ain't the place for you. But if you're looking for a place that is going to challenge you to make a contribution to the kingdom where you're not going to be comfortable sitting down and absorbing ministry, you might want to consider coming here. Almost without exception, zip, gone. Many didn't even stay for the whole service. One guy was an engineer that came and he said, Pastor, Pastor, this guy, he's in town and he's an engineer and he's looking for a church. And I'm like going, yeah, baby. All right, I'll be the carnal. Got some tithes coming in. Hallelujah. We can pay some bills. We was hurting at the time. Man, I go meet the guy, shake his hand, and he tells me he's from a Pentecostal church from out of town. Bummer. Bummer. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just not, that's not my market. It's, it's not what I'm after. And I'm, if, if you are, when you come here, I, I, I'm looking for people who are hungry. I'm looking for people who want. And I'll be, I, don't, I, I want you to keep wanting. I, I want it to stay in you. So as you get older, it's still in there. And you're still reaching for it. That's what I was telling Jeb. It's still in me. It's, I don't, it don't matter if I'm the pastor. It's just this, this, this passion, this, ah, this desire, this grab. It's, just, it, 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 it's still driving me. It still makes me stop at this gas station and speak to people. And it, It's still doing that to me. It's still making me reach to, to Michelle. Come see. I'm sorry, little man. You're going to have to drop his head. And, and Brandon, come here. Hurry, quickly. Don't even recognize that dude. Psh, look at that walk. Got that vest on. Look at this dude. Look at this. You know how they got here? You know how they're still here driving from all the way from up... West Jahunga? <laughs> Paul and I took time away from this church and did what we're called to do. Reach people with the gospel. Amen. Drove to their home several nights in a row, several weeks in a row, and taught them Bible studies. To sit down and talk Bible studies. Brandon didn't know a whole lot about the scriptures, didn't have much of a frame of reference, had to sit down through all of his dumb, ignorant questions. They weren't dumb and they weren't ignorant. He just didn't know. So we're just sitting here talking. And, and I remember after maybe the second or third Bible study, the light coming on. And he had went the next week and spoke to his father-in-law who struggled terribly with alcoholism and, and had invited Mr. Carroll to church. This dude ain't even got the Holy Ghost. This dude didn't even, he wasn't even, he, he wasn't even a member. He didn't even give an offering, I don't think. I was looking, but you didn't give anything. <laughs> Man, he's, he comes to the Bible study, boy, he's, he's, I could tell his eyes were lit up. And he, it was a whole new man. What happened? He was given it. He was given it. He was given it. And because he gave it, he got it. And he got it good. Yep. Yep. I'm, I know I'm going to embarrass you. I, I want to apologize in advance, Miss Julie. I'm so sorry, love. Would you and Glenn please come up here? I'm, I'm, I apologize, honey. Edie, let them know I'm sorry. 
Glenn ain't got a problem. Come on, come see. Glenn ain't got a problem. I'm going to get a bag you put over your head. So, I'm sorry. So Glenn and Julie, I've poured so much of my life into this. No, I didn't. Edie, come see. Come see. This is my grandbaby mama. <clears throat> my grandbaby, grandbaby, grandbaby mama. Now, Eden has worked with Julie. Stand right beside me. Eden has worked with Julie for five years. Five years, Eden has been talking to me about Julie. So much so, I get confused with all her teacher's friends. And she'd come at the supper table and say, Dad, I was talking to Julie. And I would always say, Julie. Who? Julie who? And it became her last name, as though she's from Whoville. <laughs> Julie who? I remember meeting Glenn the first time by, at Founders Park. He looked like a little boy. If, if he shaves this little facial hair, this, he could pass for a 16-year-old kid. He's got this boyish, youthful look, and he's 40-something. How old are you? No. <laughs> and he, and we, we met at the park, and I, we tried to make a connection. It just, it, it just wasn't the right timing. But Edie worked for five years, kept talking, kept talking, kept talking, kept inviting, kept inviting, kept inviting. And before long, they finally came, finally, oh, God, Dad, Dad, Dad. Glenn and Julie, Glenn and Julie are coming. Oh, God, Dad, Dad. And then when they come in the door, he's right there. Dad, they're here. Oh, oh, they're here. They're here. Oh, God, they're here. <laughs> go, go do what you do, Dad. Go, go hug them. Go kiss them. Go love on them. Go squeeze on them. Make them feel welcome. <laughs> and so Eden offered a Bible study. And so I went to their house. Eden, I went to Eden's house, rather. Eden had them over at their house. And we sat down to try to figure out what we are going to do to teach a Bible study. And we began to talk. I discovered that Glenn had very little Bible knowledge. Now, I'm not saying this to embarrass him. He just hadn't been taught. And he hadn't been brought to church. So he didn't know the stories, the basic Bible stories. He didn't know about my shack, your shack, or a bungalow. Never heard those stories. <laughs> He, he did not know how Moses got the animals in the ark or, or anything like that. Is anybody listening to what I'm saying? And so when I went to teach him a quick Bible study, I realized, no, this is going to take a little different path. And so I broke out the old chart, and that's at Eden's house. It's an old flip chart, the search for truth flip chart. And we began going through the search for truth flip chart, all 62 charts, all the way to the scary stuff. Where the people are, where the Antichrist is exposed. <laughs> and the people that have the sores and the 666 on their right hand. And conveniently, Eden had to go to the restroom when I got to that chart. <laughs> the moon turning to blood, the rivers to blood. I'm telling you, we went from Genesis to Revelation. In the first few studies, maybe after the second or third study, while I'm talking and asking questions, before I can get the question finished, Glenn is answering the questions. And Eden's getting a little, she's a little jealous. Because Eden didn't know the answers that Glenn was given. And, and like, so how, how do you know this? Well, I've been reading the Bible. You know what happened? Somebody was persistent. Listen, their children, Cheyenne and Elise, these girls are going to grow up knowing this. They, don't, they won't remember hardly. When they're in their 20s, they won't hardly remember before church. They won't know anything about that. And then whenever they're, when they're married and they have children and they're raised in the kingdom of God, they, you can thank one lady, one lady who said, I'm not giving up. I'm going to keep inviting. I'm going to keep asking. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep offering. This is a call to action. All of this junk it's a bunch of distraction from what you're supposed to be do. The gospel begins with two letters, G-O, go. Two-thirds of God is go. The gospel taking go off of gospel ends with spell. And spell is a part of witchcraft. And rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. And we, when, we, when we don't go and give the gospel, we are rebelling against God. I'm saying it as hard and as straight as I can. So what's, what's the answer, Pastor? It's in the movie industry. It's easy. Lights. Camera. Action. What is the light? Revelation. 
What is a camera? It's a device used for storing image. Vision. When there is revelation and there is vision, there's action. But until there is revelation, until there is a vision, there can be no action. You want to know why many people aren't in action right now? Because they have not had revelation and they have not had vision. But if you see what I see, if it's been illuminated, you got to say what I'm saying. Peter Marshall, you don't know who he is, but he made this statement about the 20th century Christians. He said, they are like deep sea divers encased in suits designed for many fathoms deep, marching bravely forth to pull plugs out of bathtubs. Modern day Christians in deep sea diving suits, marching bravely forward to pull the plug out of bathtubs. We've got all this equipment, got all this knowledge to do what? Come to service and cut a rug. Is that what this is about? Not cut a rug with the best of you. But that ain't what this is about. This ain't about me shouting and worshiping. This ain't about me coming to church. This ain't about me giving money. You giving money. This is all going to be gone. Somebody's going to have your money one day. It won't be God. And it won't be you. It'll be somebody else. Help me, God. Help me, God. Ben Shapiro, he's a scholar, author, podcast, content creator. He said this famously. Facts don't care about your feelings. Well, I would like to add one more to that. And faith don't care about your facts. Amen. You can bring me all the facts you want about what's going on. You can begin to quote to me all this other stuff. I'm telling you, faith trumps it all. Now, I've got up here, I finished Search for Truth with Glenn and Julie. So my next Bible study is going to be one more. And I'm going to teach them this Bible study that is free for you at JesusWorshipCenter.com. At the top tab, go to Resources. Scroll down, boom. And at Resources, you will see a bunch of free material. Two of the buttons say Home Bible Study for teacher, and one says for student. This is a six-page fill-in-the-blank Bible study. To teach it, you need only be able to read or see these little tiny letters. (laughs) If you can see the letters and if you can read, you can teach this Bible study. Because what I want to do is teach Glenn and Julie, and then I want them to get this inside of them so that they can teach others. This is the Bible study that I taught Brandon and Michelle. It's coming to me. Just give me a second. (laughs) Normally, this takes an hour to an hour and a half. It took me five or seven weeks. But I was taking my time, eating their food, (laughs) building a relationship, building their trust, going in the middle of the night to go pray with her dad, doing all these things. This is what you do when you're interested in souls. That's what somebody did for me. Somebody loved me enough to invite me and embarrass me and kept pestering me and pestering me, Clifton, please. I'm not saying Danny did it right, but Danny would say, Clifton, you're going to go to hell. (laughs) He kept saying, that, man, I'm not going to go to hell. Yeah, man, you're going to hell. You need the Holy Ghost. Oh, whatever, man. But he kept tugging at me. He kept pulling at me when I was eight years old and nine and 10 and 11 and 12. And by 12 and 13, all right, man, I started coming around. And at 14, January 2nd, 1983, I've got 10 teacher's notes up here and I've got 10 student notes. I'm wondering if there's anybody here who would do what God's calling us to do today. And that is a call to action. I am asking you in the name of Jesus Christ, find someone, invite them to church, and teach them a Bible study this week. If you'll accept that challenge, I want you to stand right now. Come to this altar. I'm I'm feeling a little pressure. (laughs) That was the point. (laughs) Gwen, Jerry, come see. Come see, come see. Come see, Miss Paula. So these ladies have been around here a while. How long have you been coming, Miss Jerry? Two and a half years, and 
I remember the first time I met Gwen. <laughs> Gwen was sassy. What else was she? Did, don't you say salty? You say salty sometimes. So Gwen, again, I want to apologize if I embarrass you, love. This is a sweet lady. Gwen, Gwen asked me for relationship advice. The first time she met me. And so here I am caught in this precarious position trying to give Gwen relationship advice. Doing the best I can to, to, to thread the needle and demonstrate love and, and to be kind, but to be honest at the same time. She's not coming to a place that's going to judge her. She's not going to come around if people and look at her like, no one's going to come here if, if you look at them funny because they're black or white or whatever. They're not coming back here. Or if you think they're, they come over here all pierced, all, I mean, you're going to look a couple times like, my God, I can't see. There's so many designs on your face. It's hard to not see that when you see someone tatted up. I mean, but, you know, they have to be honest. You wouldn't have done that if you didn't want people to look at you. So she's asking me questions. And I remember for pastor's chat, you and I talked for about 45 minutes afterwards. She came to the house and we talked outside by the pool. We had a great conversation. It was in that conversation that I realized how intelligent Gwen was. Not that she appeared dumb, but she just, she's well-read. She had been researching, and she had dug, and she had some, some content to her. I'm like, oh, I, can, I can work with this. Let's talk. And so we talked and talked and talked, and Jerry's coming along, and they've been coming around for a while. And then Paul decides, you know what? I'm going to make sure that these ladies have the word in them. I mean, they've been around church. They've got, a, they've got a good family growing up and, you know, got some Christian values. And you can argue, well, da, da, but they weren't raised heathens to... to, to to curse God and be pagans they were raised around the things of God and uh, we don't have to trash all of that just say hey there's a little bit more and so Paula took it upon herself now in case you know Miss Paula she's got plenty to do she ain't got time for this kind of foolishness but so Paula goes to their shop and teaches them Bible studies right in the middle of the day Right, hopefully after the rush hour but the problem is now they've been teaching Bible studies in the afternoon all of a sudden the traffic's picking up so you want your business to grow have Paula come teach you a Bible study <laughs> and so week after week Paula's teaching Bible studies and she started coordinating where she was in the 3D process that's what she's teaching and she wanted to make sure she taught on the baptism of the Holy Ghost the week before Pentecost Sunday that was her strategy and the strategy was so that they would receive the Holy Ghost. And Gwen received the baptism of the Holy Ghost just like Paula anticipated. Yeah. Grant and Haley, would you come up here real quick, please? Haley Holden was, was raised around this. And uh, so she's somewhat familiar, but... I don't know how much Haley knows about it. I'm sorry, uh, Grant, come on up here, sweetie. And they don't know I'm doing this. I apologize if I'm embarrassing you. That isn't my goal. Miss Paula, thank you. This is a young couple, and, and they've only been coming a little bit. And the other day, Haley didn't show up. She's full of the devil. And <laughs> Grant, oh, she was working. And Grant came all by himself. It was only this, I think that was your third time. And he, he, he comes to church and back there all by himself. I mean, you, when you see that, you're like, okay, this guy, he, he, he wants. So what does Paula do? She offers him a Bible study. Th this is how we make disciples. You have to take your time. If Paula is teaching a Bible study, that means she's not hanging out with me and I'm not hanging out with her. We're, we're making sacrifices above and beyond what we do here. We are, we are living what we're preaching live it well, I don't have to put people in heaven or hell just tell them the truth here's the scriptures and, and, and hopefully they come to a realization if they don't find the next person but teach it my, my whole message is summarized in a nutshell my reaction to the distraction is simply a call to action you ain't got time for all the nuts they're going to be saying junk no matter what you say whatever you post they're going to find fault it doesn't matter. Love them anyway. Love them. I love you, brother. Sorry. I told you before, I had to unfriend people online so I could be their friend in life. And I am. There's some people, I, we, we can't even talk, bro, if we're going to talk about that. So let's talk about something else. Let's talk about Jesus. 
and then we, 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 we'll be good. But we talk about politics, we're going to have a fight. We talk about other junk, we might have a little argument. So we're not going to talk about those, so we're going to lift up Jesus Christ, because ultimately that's what unites us all, in Jesus' name. So in the name of the Lord, I bless these young men and ladies who are up here. I thank you, Lord, for the Bible studies that have been taught and for the lives that are being changed. In the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for these other couples that you've worked in. I pray, God, that you would anoint and bless. May what's been done to them and for them be done through them for others. And may it catch fire in this church. I plead your blood over the men and women in this room. May they never forget what they've heard and felt and the commitment they've made to you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Would you lift up your hands one more time? Pray a simple prayer. Father, lead me to the hurting, the hungry, the humble, and the honest. Lead me to people that are in the 4-H club. Lead me this week, God. Show me who it is. Lead me to them, Father. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone said amen. I've got 10 teacher's notes and 10 student notes. They're right here. The teacher's notes are on this side, so you need one from each stack. But you can go online and download it for free and print it yourself at JesusWorshipCenter.com. Clap your hands to the Lord. That was my point. I did what I was called to do today. That was the whole thing. In the midst of all this craziness, go reach somebody. Do the work of an evangelist. Save a soul. Save a soul. Be what you want for your son and your daughter whose backs that are lost right now. Be that for somebody else's dad. Be that for somebody else's mom. Be that for somebody else's son or grandchild. In Jesus' name, amen. Clap your hands to the Lord. I love you. That's it. You're dismissing Jesus' name. I'll see you Wednesday.